group of people came to see the Buddha one time and complained that they had heard so many different teachings from so many different people, all very contradictory. They didn't know who to trust. Of course, the question was, were they going to trust the Buddha? And he gave them some standards for deciding what's skillful. In other words, if you put a teaching into practice, what results do you get? And then you measure the results by whether they harm yourself or they harm other people. We live in a pluralistic society, very much like that in the time of the Buddha. Lots of different theories about what's right and wrong. In fact, it's almost impossible to do something without being criticized from one angle or another. If you meditate, there are people who criticize you for meditating. If you don't meditate, there are people who criticize you for not meditating. You hold to the precepts, you get criticized. You don't hold to the precepts, you get criticized. So what you've got to do is learn how not to listen to the criticism and ask yourself, what, when I do it, leads to well-being? And the Buddha gives you some guidelines. One is you look at your actions in terms of what you, what you do and what you tell other people to do. That's the first area that you have to focus on, because some of our actions may ripple out into the society in ways that are really hard to track down and hard to anticipate. And if you get too concerned with the widespread ripple effects, you tend to miss what you're actually doing and what you're actually telling other people to do. And that's the area where you really are responsible. If once you've got that area down, then you move into other areas further out, okay, that's up to you. But the first focal point you have to have is, what am I actually doing and what am I actually telling other people to do? And are those things skillful or not? Are they harmful or not? The Buddha measures harm in two ways. One, harming yourself. One, the other is harming others. Harming yourself is starts out by breaking the precepts, the five precepts, no killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no intoxicants. You engage in these things, the Buddha said, even though you may gain some temporary gain from them, still the long-term effects are going to be bad. That, he says, is harming yourself. To harm others, you actually get them to break the precepts. And so if you're choosing an occupation, choosing a way of life, you have to ask yourself, is anything in this particular occupation going to require me to get other people to kill or steal or have illicit sex or lie or take intoxicants? If so, that's an occupation you want to avoid. The other way of harming other people and harming yourself is on the case of harming yourself is you engage in something that's going to give rise to greed, aversion, or delusion, or passion, aversion, and delusion in your own mind. Because if you have those qualities in the mind, they're going to lead you to act in ways that are unskillful. Delusion, in particular, will make it difficult to see what's skillful or not. You harm others by trying to incite passion, aversion, and delusion in them. So again, if you look at a particular occupation, a particular way of life, does it depend on inciting greed and passion in people? Does it depend on inciting anger in them? Or getting them diluted. Those are things you want to avoid. So that simplifies things quite a lot. Again, this is the beginning stage in trying to decide what you want to do with your life, how you want to lead your life. Get these basic principles down. And then if you want to deal with things further away, 
And that's, that's your gift to yourself and other people. When you get into the area of gifts, the Buddha said, you give where you're inspired. You don't have to justify your giving to anybody. If you have something, it's yours. And you want to give it to somebody else, it's your choice to give to someone else. King Basenity once came to the Buddha and asked him, where should a gift be given? And the Buddha said, where you feel inspired or where you feel it be well used. Then the king said, well, a gift given where it gives great fruit? And the Buddha said, well, that's a different question. If you give to people who are devoid of passion, aversion, and delusion, or are practicing to get beyond passion, aversion, and delusion, he said, that gives great fruit. But again, the choice is yours. He's not saying only give to those people. In fact, he said, if you say, give only to my group and not to the other group, you're creating a lot of demerit. Don't you get in the way of anybody's giving a gift, he says, there's demerit. You, you harm yourself, you harm the person who's, who's giving, you harm the person who's going to receive the gift. So you don't stand in the way of anyone else's generosity, but at the same time, no one else has the right to demand that you be generous, or to say that you have some duty be, to be generous in a way that you don't feel inspired to give. This opens up a lot of freedom. And this quality of freedom in your choice of how you want to be generous with your time is an important principle in the Buddhist, you might just say, culture. Because an important part of the teaching on karma is that you are free to make choices. And one of the first ways you are sensitive to your freedom is when you decide to give something, something that you could have used yourself. But you say, no, I'd rather give it to someone else. That's a moment of freedom from your own greed, from your own stinginess, your own narrowness. And when you learn to appreciate that, that you have that choice, that is the beginning of the path. So many of the Buddha's lists of ways of explaining the Dharma start with generosity. The three forms of inner worth start with generosity. The talk that he would give to get people ready to hear the Four Noble Truths starts with generosity. Here in the West we've often learned about Buddhism, it's one of the first things we learn, the Four Noble Truths. And the question is, are we ready to hear about them? The Buddha would get people ready. He said, he was like taking a piece of cloth that you want to dye. And first you've got to clean the cloth, make sure there's no dirt on it. No stains on it. And then it's ready to take the dye. In the same way, your mind has to be prepared to hear the Four Noble Truths, to understand what they're for, and to appreciate them. And the Buddha would start with generosity. Just what a good thing it is. And how it is an expression of freedom. Then he would move on to virtue. In some cases, he would explain virtue also as a gift. You're giving a gift of universal safety. When you observe the five precepts, and you observe them without exception. In other words, you don't say, well, I'll avoid killing in some cases, but there's other things that I want to kill, or I think killing is okay. Or there are cases where I think it's okay to lie, or okay to take things. And you see this all over, the exceptions that people make to the precepts. And that's not much of a gift. It's a very partial gift. You're giving safety to some people and not to others. But if you hold by the precepts in all cases, as the Buddha says, you're giving universal safety to everybody. They may not be safe from danger from other quarters, but they're safe from danger from you. And when you give that kind of gift, you, can, you gain a part, you gain a portion of that safety too. And then after talking about generosity and virtue, the Buddha would talk about the rewards of the two, both in this lifetime and then in the pleasant lifetimes afterwards. But then he'd start talking about the drawbacks. 
even of pleasant lifetimes hereafter, because after all, heaven doesn't last, last forever. And it's very easy for the mind to get carried away with the pleasures that come, being generous and being virtuous. This is one of the reasons why the life of human beings, the life of all beings, goes up and down. We work for goodness, we, for the sake of goodness for a while, and then we start wallowing in the results. And we get heedless and careless. Especially start getting carried away by sensual pleasures, the mind gets intoxicated. And again, there's a lot of delusion around those pleasures. And that's when the Buddha said you'd be ready to hear about renunciation. Renunciation is not just giving things up, but it's actually making a trade for some something better. A state of mind that is free from having to be a slave to sensuality. Like the state of concentration we're working on now. That's actually a form of renunciation. We're putting aside all the thoughts we could have about the food we might eat tomorrow or the fix tomorrow or the other pleasures you might get when you leave the monastery. You put those aside and you're just here with the breath coming in going out. This is called a pleasure of form. As you work with the breath so it feels good all the way down through the torso. Now the related energy is going all the way down through the arms and the legs. This is called the pleasure of renunciation. When you're ready to see that renunciation is a good thing, that's when the Buddha would teach the Four Noble Truths. Because as the mind gets more and more sensitive, it begins to see there are ways in which it still imposes unnecessary stress on itself. I mean, it's bad enough that there's aging, illness, and death in life, there's separation from the things that we love. But we add a lot of unnecessary suffering on top of that. And that's the suffering, actually, and the stress that really weighs the mind down, which is why the Buddha focused his teachings there in solving this particular problem. He came from a wealthy family. He could have been a ruler. And he could have ruled wisely, but he saw that that wasn't going to be enough to deal with the problems that human beings have. In other words, fixing up the world outside, there's no end to that. Because when you think about human desires, as the Buddha said, if, even if it rained gold coins, we wouldn't have enough for our desires. So looking for completion, looking for contentment that way is the wrong way. Trying to straighten out the world. There's, there's a lot in the world that resists straightening out. That's why the Buddha focused on straightening out the mind. He said, if you solve this problem, then people don't create suffering for themselves. On the one hand, they benefit. On the other hand, the people around them benefit too. That's why he focused on this. We can get rid of our greed, aversion, and delusion. We benefit, and the other people around us don't have to be victims of our greed, aversion, and delusion. So this is why this is the important point in which he focused. And explain it comes from our three, form, <clears throat> three forms of craving, and these things can be uprooted. We can develop dispassion for them by following the path. Virtue, concentration, discernment. These three activities are key to lessening our own suffering and lessening the burdens we place on others. So we focus here. It's not much three parts of the training, but it really helps to have things boiled down like this. Now to follow this path requires some trial and error. 
Because after all, we do have people to show us the way, but we have to follow the way ourselves. They can't do the work for us. As the Buddha said, he simply points out the way. It's up to you to follow it. And there's some things that are laid out clearly, and other things you've got to, dis you've got to learn for yourself. And this can be another source of indecision. I mean, it's on top of the fact that our culture pulls us in many different directions. There's part of the mind that doesn't want to make mistakes, or doesn't want to be accused of making mistakes, or blamed for making a mistake. This is where we have to have the, the courage to say, well, I'm going to act on what seems to be best, but then keep an eye out for any unexpected bad consequences. In other words, you really take responsibility for your actions and their results. And you want to learn from them. The type of attitude that says, I don't want to make mistakes at all, gets in the way of doing many things that are really skillful. But the attitude is, I'm always willing to learn. Be careful to gauge my actions before I do them, and then watch them carefully as I do them, and then after they're done. And if I say anything that seems to be harmful, of course, you don't want to act on it to begin with, but if you thought it was going to be okay, but it turns out it was not, then you want to talk it over with someone. This is one of the parts of the reasons why the Buddha said that the path depends on noble friendship or admirable friendship. They not only point out the way, but they also can give you advice. They can give you examples. This is why you want to choose your friends carefully, the people to whom you go for advice. But with their support and with the quality the Buddha calls appropriate attention, i.e., looking to see things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, where you're causing unnecessary stress, how you can stop, those two qualities will take you far. And they can cut through a lot of indecision in what to do with your life. So even though the culture around us may pull us in diff different directions and there's a part of us that is afraid to make mistakes, you begin to realize there's nothing you can do that's not going to be criticized from one angle or another. So you want to choose some wise standards so you can gauge other people's criticism to see when it's valid or not. And as you're looking for a set of standards to try out, the Buddha's I've stood the test for 2,500 years. And so it's worth giving them a try. <laughs>